So let's talk about note taking. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that your notes don't have to look like this. This is very nice, and if your notes do look like this, then that's great. However, they don't have to. If your notes don't look like this, doesn't mean that they're any worse. Your notes basically have to work for you. Uh, this was clearly done by someone who had some time for it, and also is likely a very visual learner, so the colors and the diagrams will help them. That may not be your learning preference. The important thing is, though, that you make your own notes. Um, your prof probably posts some PowerPoints online, but uh, those PowerPoints, they are really for your prof. They're not really meant for you. Uh, basically, your prof is using them to stay on topic and as a cue to remember what to talk about next. Uh, your prof's notes on their own are rarely enough of a study tool for students. So if you want to be able to learn things better, you need to write your own notes. Now, this helps your brain encode the information better because you will get information to maybe three different forms of input. And so you will hear it from the prof, you will be writing it down, and you will also be seeing what you're writing. And there is some evidence that a multimodal approach helps with learning. Now, what's the best way to take notes? Now, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, different things work for different people, but the main thing is to keep in mind that you should not write down every word your prof says. Uh, you will need to listen carefully and evaluate what is being said in order to select the key points. Now, by the way, uh, this form of active listening will also help with retention. It means that you're paying attention and trying to understand as you listen. And paying attention is really what helps your brain understand that this is something important. Now, if you've been doing this, then you should be able to also write your notes in your own words. And that's much more helpful than trying to make sense of the words that your prof used later on. So, write in your own words would be one of the best things you could do. Now, you, you might ask, well, how do I know what's important if it's all new? And this is why uh, pr prior preparation is so important. We've talked about this in previous videos. As you're preparing for your lectures, you can actually start making notes as you skim your chapter. This would allow you to produce a sort of a skeleton outline of the lecture, to which you will add information as your prof talks about things in class. At that point, you'll have a better idea of what to expect and what to listen for as well. So, how do you actually do it? Well, there are many methods that you can use for note-taking, uh, but there are three that seem to be the most popular, and those would be the Cornell method, the outline method, and the mind mapping method. These are all a little different from each other, and everyone has their own preferences, so I would recommend that you try them out and figure out what works best for you. Now, since this is a YouTube video, I won't spend any time explaining them in detail. I will simply link to some videos that explain them a little bit better. So, please click and view. So, once you have made your notes, you have taken your first steps to studying. You have basically just generated some studying material, which you will need to review from time to time. Now, the reviewing is important because of how your memory works. Basically, there are three types of memory. There is working memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Now, if we follow this diagram, we see that your new information is going to initially enter your working memory. This includes anything that you see or hear. Everything goes into working memory initially. Then after that, if you decide that it's important, it will be transferred into short-term memory for a short period of time. Now, if that piece of information is being used fairly frequently, if you recall it multiple times, at some point your brain will get the message that, hmm, maybe this is important, I should store this in long-term memory, and at which point it gets transferred into long-term memory. This is the one that you want to get stuff into. And by the way, this graphic here seems like a pretty good form of note-taking. When speaking of memory, we need to talk about something called the forgetting curve. The forgetting curve describes how much information is lost from your memory over time. And it is based on some memory experiments by a psychologist named Hermann Ebbinghaus. Hermann Ebbinghaus was trying to figure out how memory works. And so to do that, he would try to memorize lists of things. What he did, though, was lists of things that were completely unfamiliar to him, things that did not already have an association with something else in his brain, 
and so he chose to memorize lists of nonsense syllables because they would all be equally difficult for him to remember. And so what he did, he, was, he would sit down with a list of maybe 20 of these syllables and he would try to memorize all of them in one study session. He would then uh, test his ability to remember them at different times after his learning session. What he found was that most of what he learned in his study sessions was lost within a day and about 50% of it was lost within the hour. And thus we have the forgetting curve. So this figure on the left basically shows how much Hermann Ebbinghaus would remember at different periods after his study session. So immediately after his study session he would remember 100% of it. But then within about 20 minutes to an hour he would only remember about 50 to 60 percent of the information that he had studied. And so by the end of the day and well into the next week, all he would remember was probably about 20 to 30 percent of what he had initially studied. Now Ebbinghaus continued his research to see if he could improve his recall and found that well-timed review sessions helped him recall the whole set of syllables even weeks later. This means that his brain had encoded and stored it in his long-term memory, something that you want to do as well. Now, if we look at the graph that's on the bottom left now, what we're looking at is the updated forgetting curve with all the different sessions worked into it. So he would review his list of words a day after his first review. And so, as you can see from the blue line, Initially, from the first study session to his first review session, he had lost about 55% of the material, but when he reviewed it, he brought his memory of it back up to 100%. And then, again, his forgetting curve would start again, this time at a bit more of a shallower or slower pace, until his second review, maybe three days after his first study session. And so, three days after the first study session, he would maybe retain about 70% of what he had learned. And so again, he would study and bring his memory up to 100%. And then again, the forgetting would begin. And so he would study once again about a week later, so about 10 days after his initial study session. And again, at, by this point, he would have maybe still retained about 80% of what he had learned in that first session. And so again, he would bring his memory back up to 100 and as you can see, after each review session, that forgetting curve gets shallower and shallower. Basically, what you're doing by doing this kind of a repeated sessions of studying is you are stimulating certain neurons over and over. And after a while, these neurons start to pay more attention to the stimulus uh, that coming from that path. This means that it will be easier for those neurons uh, to fire again the same way the next time that you think about that topic, and that's memory. So, essentially, by doing this sort of spaced repetition suggested in this figure, each time a little more of the information is saved into long-term memory. So, if you were to draw a curve to connect the amount of remembered material at each review session, we would get what is called the learning curve, and that's shown here in green. So, as you can see, the more reviews you have, the more and more material you start to remember over the long term. So based on this, here's what your study might look like from now on. After your initial exposure to the material, so your initial lecture maybe, you would review your material initially as soon as possible after class. You would then review material again the next day, and then you would review again about a week later, maybe hopefully maybe three or four days later, but a week will do if you have to. And then after that, several weeks later again, hopefully no more than a month. Each time, you will likely need to spend a little less time on it because more and more of it will already be in your long-term memory. You will simply be adding up a little bit more of the stuff that you had forgotten. So as you can see from these learning curves or these forgetting curves that have been updated now, that spaced repetition is really the key to getting things into your long-term memory. Now, if you ever tried to learn a language using an app like Duolingo, uh, you will notice that words that you've seen before and studied before will show up again in later sessions at 
seemingly random times. And you might think at that point, but I've already studied this word, I know this one. Well, they're basically using the same principle. They're using this kind of idea of spaced repetition to help uh, ensure that that word stays in your long-term memory. So, as we've already seen in previous videos, um, there are different definitions of studying. And so, after an exam, for example, some students might say, but I studied so hard for that test. And so, there are two things that you could say, I could say to that. Um, your definition of studying hard might be different than my definition of studying hard. Also, I don't want you to study hard. I want you to study smart. Okay, and so how do we do that? Well, number one, you apply what you've learned about the learning curve. Secondly, you figure out what works best for you in terms of learning preferences. How do you prefer to study? Do you study best by discussing things in a group? Or do you prefer to study by yourself? Do you prefer videos? Do you prefer diagrams? Do you prefer writing things down or listening to things? These are things that will help you figure out what is best for your particular learning needs. Next, don't try to study four chapters all at once. Long sessions are not effective. Your brain gets tired and you need to take breaks periodically. And now that you know about space repetition, you may want to figure out a schedule for your study sessions. We'll talk more on that in a moment. Next, don't procrastinate. I know, I know. It's easy to say, but much more difficult to do. So here's something that might actually help. You may want to use a timer and process-oriented studying. Now you might ask, what do you mean by process-oriented? Or what is goal-oriented? What is this stuff all about? Well, goal-oriented studying is when you say, I will study until I finish this chapter. You basically set yourself a goal, and you are not done until you reach that goal. Now, the problem with this type of studying, and this is what most people do, uh, the problem with this type of studying is that you will set the goal, then you will look at the number of pages that you have to read through, and it's a biology textbook, so it's between 30 and 40 pages typically. And then you will think, this will take forever. And then you will think, I need a snack. Or you will grab your phone and complain to your friends about all the studying that you're doing. And so procrastination begins. With process-oriented studying, the goal is to study for a set period of time. So we don't set ourselves a, a goal of we get to the end of the chapter. Instead we say we will study for 25 minutes and once the 25 minutes is over you take a break. A short break, but you take a break and then maybe you get that snack that you wanted. Then you go back and study for another 25 minutes if that's what you have time for. The reason that this works is that 25 minutes is not a terribly long time so it's much easier to motivate yourself to sit and study. With this method it really doesn't matter if you finish the chapter within that short time period. But if you do a few of these short sessions, you will finish it at some point. Now, this method of breaking up work into short intervals is called the Pomodoro Technique, and it's known to be quite effective. Next, you want to avoid distractions. Uh, I've already talked about the problem that your phone poses for your ability to focus. When you're studying, you need to minimize the chances that something will distract you and pull you away. So, don't study in front of a TV and don't keep Facebook open in the other browser tab. Lastly, make sure you get some rest when you're tired. Do not study late into the night. A tired brain will not process information very well. Now some of you might say, but I have so much other stuff to do during the day. Well, this is where you may need to sit down and do some scheduling and become a bit more regimented in how you use your time. The first thing you should do is go through your syllabus. Now you might say, what is a syllabus? What are you talking about? Uh, well, the syllabus is your, the document that your prof posted for you sometime at the beginning of the semester. Uh, it's the one that most students don't bother reading because it won't be on the exam. Now, the syllabus will give you some administrative details about the course, including things like the number of hours in your class. Now, this will help you to figure out how much time you want to spend on it per week. It will also likely list all of your assignments and due dates. Now, by the way, 
Make sure that you make a note of how much each assignment is worth. This will help you figure out how much time to commit to each one. For example, if you have two assignments in two courses with due dates next week, and one is worth 20% of your final grade while the other is worth 2%, you know which one you need to focus on. The same is true of any quizzes, tests, or exams. Once you've collected all that info, enter it into a calendar and then set yourself some reminders. Next, set up a weekly schedule for yourself. First, enter all of your class times and any other regular weekly activities. So all your extracurricular stuff would go here, things like club meetings, if you're on a sports team and you have regular practices, that would be on there as well. These are things that you have to be there for. Now that might also include things like reading bedtime stories to your younger siblings, or if you have kids, reading stories to your own kids. And then you want to set some limits for your studying. You don't want it to take over your whole life. And so you want to start trying to schedule your studying sessions. And just remember to do it in short sessions with frequent breaks. And remember to use what you've learned about the learning curve. So timing is important. Do this soon. So. Here's an example of a weekly schedule for a typical first-year student in our program at QU as prepared by Ms. Rada. The classes are colored in and she has tried to schedule in frequent review sessions, but notice that she has also put in significant amounts of free time. The important thing to keep in mind is that if you make a schedule that does not give you any time for fun, friends, and family, you won't stick to it. So, Try to follow the advice I've given you, but be willing to be flexible and to make your life fit into your schedule. Now, I'd like to close with a quick overview. One, show up. Don't miss class unless you're actually sick. You could miss a lot by missing class. Two, do your reading before lectures, or rather skim through the relevant sections in your textbook paying special attention to terminology, concepts, and figures. Make some notes as you go along. These will be helpful for you in lecture. Three, once in class, take your own notes. Do not rely on the prof's PowerPoint only. By all means, you can print them with some extra space for your own notes. This way you can add stuff and label things as your prof talks about them. Just make sure you're actively listening and trying to pull out the most important information. Don't just write every word your prof says. Four, figure out a schedule for your week. Make sure the study time per course is appropriate to each course. Now, some courses are heavier than others, and so they will need more time for review. Other courses are fairly light, so they will need less time. So adjust as necessary. And make sure that, again, your life fits into your schedule as well. Five, don't study hard, study smart. Don't try to study all six chapters the night before the exam. Yes, you might spend the whole night on it, but most of what you learn during that time will be lost long before you get your exam paper. And at this point, you know why that is. You should also use spaced repetition to your advantage when planning your study schedule. And make sure that you use process-oriented studying to help you. And that's especially important when you're trying to avoid procrastination. So, I will end here. Thank you for your time and attention.